You unlock this benefit with the key of Patreon. Beyond is another dimension. A dimension of thought. A dimension of speculation. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both waffle and substance. Of things and ideas. You've just crossed into the podcast zone. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our Twilight Zone journey. We are still going, but you know what? It's time to pull up a chair and read a book for time enough at last. But this is a special episode. It's not just me and Julian today. We are being joined by Tony Farina. We are getting some extra Twilight knowledge going on here. So, Tony, how are you doing? You okay? Very well. Thanks for having me. Uh, Twilight Zone is top two favorite shows of all time. So uh, I'm very excited to talk about it. Excellent. And Julian, how are you doing? This is a, a what is this? Our not eighth episode now we're getting in. So really... yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm I'm just very confused about uh, having learned the penguin's origin story. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I good. can't. Oh, I will say one thing. Burgess Meredith is one of those so such a recognizable character actor. Um, unfortunately, you say the penguin, which I do know. I can't get past Mickey. Mickey, of course. Yeah. <laughs> This is Mickey before you took up boxing. And isn't he in two different episodes in season one of Twilight Zone? I think so, yes. Yeah, yeah the alien one. Mm, yeah, yeah, the aliens, yeah, the aliens in the bar next door. So I think he did mm. like two different characters. It just not like over the course, but I think they're those are both in season one, I think, too. So it's like I'm really one of the things I'm really enjoying about doing this is just clocking up all the sort of uh, character actors that became famous later on. It's really cool to see them all. So, um, yes, no, yeah. But first of all, this, you know, that you came on because you shared a real interest in this episode. So, you know, oh. give us your general thinks and thoughts on this before we get into it. This general thoughts on the, on the time enough at last. Yeah. So, as a book nerd, as we are, as the three of us are, this is not. You're not super shocked that this is my favorite Twilight <laughs> Zone episode ever. Um, so I would, so I grew up, um, in Southwest Michigan, but close enough, like I could see the Sears tower light across Lake Michigan. Like that's how far down it was like at night, not during the day, mm-hmm. but at night I could see it. So sh- the, Chicago had this channel called WGN, which still exists. D- Julian, you know all about it, right? It's, it's a super station now, but we could just get it with regular TV. And so I wasn't much of a sleeper as a kid. And so I would stay up late at night and the twilight zone was always on. Uh, that's how I saw Rock and Roll High School on a you know four inch black and white TV, which that changed my life too. But I saw this episode and I sobbed uncontrollably at the end of this thing, and still rewatching it for this lump in the throat, knowing it's coming. Um, so this episode for me, it was of all of the things that ever happened to the Twilight Zone, the Hitchhiker one that scared the shit out of me, and all those things. This is the one that lives with me forever that I love because. If the Twilight Zone is all about personal hell, which I think there's an allegory there, the Twilight Zone is about each person's personal hell, because our main character seems like a relatively decent guy in this one. But what is your personal hell? And he experiences it. And he and I, like, I get, I'm I'm him. Like, I was like, Mm -hmm. as a kid, of all the things that happened in the Twilight Zone that scared me, this is the one that broke my heart. And I realized (laughs) that art, art could do that in a different way, that it wasn't just books. Because, of course, I would, you know, I read Of Mice and Men and I cried and whatever. Mm. But watching a show, 24 minutes, just, you know, who I knew him as the Penguin first, of course. I already know. But to see this, um, it lives with me forever. I think about it all the time. Um, I've read the short story that upon which it is based. I just, I love it so much. And so when you ask, hey, what's your favorite? It's always, it's, even though it kills me every time, it just is um, the embodiment of, of, of what my person, if I were in the Twilight Zone, this would be my story. <laughs> this is this is the one that you'd experience. Yeah, I think so. It is it is a goodie. It is a goodie. It's what it, as far as I'm as far as I'm aware, it, it's one of those classic ones that gets referenced a lot. Um, it, I I know this by reputation before I'd even seen it, so I know it's sort of a, a known one. Uh, but Julian, what, so what were your initial thoughts and what were your sort of uh, your um... oh, my thoughts? I just want to hear Tony talk. He's so enthusiastic, <laughs> you know, and I'm like. That's totally my memory of like Doctor Who and soap and all this this world I discovered late night, you know, on the the little black and white TV and stuff. Um, like yeah, I mean, so, yeah, what a show. I, I identify with all that. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you said soap. That show was so far ahead of its time. Oh, you yeah. stopped me <laughs> to do a 20th century geek retrospective on soap. What a show. Anyway, sorry. 
Yeah, I love that. I, and it's hard to get these days. I, you know. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, uh, but what's funny is I love all of your enthusiasm. I love everything you're saying. And I am kind of like so familiar with this episode that I have the exact opposite reaction. Like, I think like it's good. I like it. But he's a dick. Like, mm. you know, his wife is depicted as like the most uh, Cro-Magnon version of like a henpecked wife who's like, golly gee, I hate books, you know, you know, and he's and he has seems to have this idea like, thank you for paying me for doing my job, but I really don't want to do it and I'm going to sneak yeah. away. And I think like, does that make me, you know, uh, uh, it, it's like reading um uh, death of a salesman th today, and you think he's got a really good job. What's he complaining about? <laughs> you know, none of us have pensions today. You know? <laughs> and, you know, I watch this and I think, dude, you're lucky that you weren't fired immediately. Uh, that, that, that's interesting because it, it's uh, it is one of those things watching this episode. There are moments when I feel real sympathy for him. Um, and I, I do, I, yeah. I'm easily, I'm easily sort of uh, um, pulled into these things. So, yeah, his wife is a hot, is vile. Like you know, she, I mean, oh. when she when she pencils it all out in the book, like I, I, I'm sort of like you know, ju just seeing the vandalism in the book, I get angry. I'm just, like, oh, oh, oh. but you're right. When he's sat, he's a bank. He's, he works in a bank. He's a bank teller. And um, when you see him and he's doing his thing, and then he's sat, he's reading under the till, like and. Being someone who obviously, you know, sort of um, works in a position of having to make people work, you know, to, oh, my, I've got to hit deadlines, I've got to hit, you know, I've got to make things delivered. Just seeing that riles my blood. <laughs> so I'm just like, just do your job. You get, we see later he has a lunch break. Just wait, do your job, read later. So, um, and then he's surprised when his boss gets annoyed with him. Which yeah, you know, so there is that part where I'm just like, he he, he seems a little bit distracted throughout. <laughs> Oh, for sure. No, that's totally true. You both make incredibly valid points. And yes, that's all true. But of course, the only reason he's doing it, and Julian, you called her the henpecked wife, and she is awful. It is totally a caricature of everything. But because she's he's not allowed to read at home, he's not allowed to mm -hmm. read here. So for him, it's like he would have, because the, the manager does say, I see you sneaking away at your lunch break to go read, which again is totally fine. But now he's starting to read at work because he's not allowed to read at home because his wife mm -hmm. won't let him. And, and so, so for him... You're right, he should have been fired, there's no doubt about it. But of course, the whole show is this commentary on anti-intellectualism, right? Yeah. Because it, the big headline, I mean, talk about beating you over the head with text. We don't even, there's no subtext. He's looking at the headline that says, you know, nuclear war is bad, essentially. And then, yeah. and what we're learning is, well, if we had just read a book and had a thought and, and thought things through and had empathy for others, maybe there wouldn't be war. And I know that's that's what it's saying. That's the subtext, but it's very light on the subtext and hard on the text. So you're both totally right. I concede that he is definitely a terrible employee. And if one of my adjuncts instructors were was that, you know, lackadaisical about doing his or her job, out that person would go. Yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but even his wife though, one of the things is, again, and I know what you say it's a caricature. But it's the sort of the pettiness of it, the 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 sort of setting him up, um, oh. and and because I always find this, and I think Julian, we've talked about this in, in in other episodes or even other things we've done, uh, you know, when we've reviewed, of saying like, what, what, you know, these people clearly hate each other. <laughs> why are they together? Like it's she she clearly despises him, and I'm sort of like, so why are you with him? Like what? What what benefit are you getting from this? But yeah, the fact she sets him up with that poetry book and he gets that sort of like really boyish enthusiasm. He's like, oh my God, yes, I would love to read to you from this book. And then he opens it up and it's all been destroyed. And it's sort of like vindictive and just mean. Um, and it, it, yeah, it, it, it sort of, um, it's the little things in that throughout the episode where I'm sort of like, you know, the clear you say, it's not subtle. He's building you up to a specific thing. <laughs> But um, I'm I'm not you know in half an hour I'm sort of like going yeah no no I'm fully on board with this person apart from doing it on the, you know reading on the job, um, so when the bomb comes and he actually says about like all the people that are gone, you know, he actually depicts and says you know oh my, you know it's whatever his wife is or he you know, Helen you know is it yeah he Helen, um, he actually sort of laments them and sort of shows a bit of of, of you know uh, grief. I don't know why. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
It's a good question. You can't imagine he has a ton of friends, right? I mean, mm. he's he's. I mean, he does. His boss doesn't like him. He she he's being forced to go to a dinner party that he doesn't want to go to. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I find myself thinking of like the stranger, where you know we're supposed to. I think we're supposed to see him as an outsider who we identify mm-hmm. with, and it's like. Why isn't there a place in society for this guy? You know, yeah. it, and and I feel that. I mean, and I we're all sort of artsy fartsy intellectuals. You know, we we, we <laughs> identify with him. Um, but I also think, like, the older I get, the more I feel like when I see these sorts of relationships, I think, you know, put your foot down, tell yeah. your wife, like, I look, I need some time alone. I'm an introvert, and I like to read. You know. Uh, go to the party alone, but I'm not going to do it. And the older I get, the more I see those characters and I end up resenting them in those scenes that I'm supposed mm. to feel bad for them. <laughs> because he <laughs> has no agency. Yeah. Yeah. And because it's, you know, and, and because he's such a wimp and, you know, I get it. You know, there should be room for wimps. But why did you marry this person? And And also, why can't you just be honest enough to say, no, I'm not going to do this. I don't want to go to that dinner party. I need to de- de-stress. I don't have time to read. I mean, these are things that we can say in an honest relationship. Mm-hmm. But I mean, of course, nobody back then, especially men, did not talk about their feelings, right? Yeah. You know? <laughs> just... yeah. That would have been that would have been the twist of this episode of Twilight Zone if he actually came out and was like, "Look, I'm having some real sort of mental health." Uh, you know, the pressure's on, I need a mental health day. And that would have been the twist. You'd have had Rod Serling cut in then and be sort of like, you know, this man decides to talk about his feelings. And that'd be it. <laughs> you cut to Rod smoking. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and that was, that's the end. It's only 10 minutes. You're like, ah, we didn't see that coming. The yeah. end. <laughs> 1960s man. But, it, you know, as you say, it's also an anti-nuclear war thing, right? Yeah. And, you know, that that subtext of sort of like, you know, if we just listened, if we just read, you know, these politicians aren't intellectuals. They're not, you know, really taking this. Ser- the generals certainly aren't, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if that's true, but, you know, I like, you know, I think I, I certainly like these sort of anti-war, anti-nuclear war uh, messages. And, uh, you know, there's something very poetic about books being destroyed, whether it's by being marred or the damage of the library and mm-hmm. seeing that kind of destruction and books strewn around that you think, you know, it, it reminds you of books burnings and things like that. And you instantly feel like this is a terrible thing. Um, whereas in the abstract, nuclear war is like, well, that's bad, but, you know, well, I hope it doesn't happen. But you give somebody that image of that decimated library and books strewn around, you're like, Wait a minute. Civilization's on the line. Yeah, I mean, this is. I have a. I have. <laughs> I sort of have feelings about the 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 finale of this episode. In that, for that reason, uh, having watched sort of, um, and again, this might just be from what we've watched since. You know, we've seen had films like you know, Terminator Two or um, all these other films that have depicted sort of like post nuclear wastes you know we, we've now seen actual photos of like hiroshima and nagasaki post uh the bombs dropping so you see this one and everything's a mess like everything's been destroyed that's you know it's fine i get that you know um but the books seem all right mm-hmm. <laughs> um and no and he's just sort of sat there going like ah well you know then this month and next month and then june and july as he goes through the piles of books and in my head all i'm thinking is you're going to be dead before July through nuclear sickness. So, right. <laughs> of course he is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's the only upside to the ending is that because he breaks his glasses and he can't find the gun because he was about to kill himself, he's mm. not going to make it anyway. But um, I do think though that it was bold to tell this story in the height of the Cold War in mm. the jingoistic America, like the Russians are bad. I mean, we've built up. This idea, and I, I would love to know, like in in your perspective, Scott, as a not American, like growing up, Julian and I are roughly the same age, so we grew up thinking the Russians were this big bad powerhouse, and you know they're they're bad in all, but we made them the bad guy. Like they weren't a rich country; they're geographically large, and so they seem scary. But like, there's 18 people spread out across seven. 
down. They don't have the natural resources of a China or an India or even a Japan, which of course we, you know, blew to smithereens. So it's just funny that we grew up in this time. And so when this is made, you know, 1959, you know, that's the height of the Cold War and the Russians are evil and they're power, They're as powerful as us and they're this. But then we learn in hindsight, like none of that is true. Yeah. So it's interesting for someone to have the balls to make a show that points out that, that this is bad, that nuclear war is bad. Don't be saber rattling, you idiots. Because, you know, even if they're then taking the Russians serious, like in this book, they're taking the Russians, this show, they're taking the Russians seriously mm -hmm. when we know the government really wasn't. But the people were. So I just appreciate Serling saying, I read this short story. I'm going to turn it into this show and remind people that nuclear war is terrible. Mm. Well, w one of the things that, that is legit uh, frightening about it is the speed at which it happens as well. That 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 is actually stands out for me. It's like, you know, he sat in the vault having his sandwich, reading a book, and then it just it just happens. You know, there's, there's sort of like, you know, it's. there's no warning. There's no sort of like, you know, there's no like, big setup. There's no sort of like, there's no. Even in the episode, it's not like there's loads of people around sort of saying, you know, like, like X-Men and no, X -Men, Watchmen, where it's like, you know, five, two minutes to midnight or tensions rise with Russia. There's none of this sort of foreshadowing. It just sort of like, I don't know, it's, it's in the background and it just happens. And that sort of boils that fear forward that like, you know, this could just happen at any point. Like We can't influence it. If it was to happen, it happens. <laughs> Yeah, so the, and they and they they bring it back. Have you guys been watching the Jordan Peele one? Not yet. No, yeah. I, I'm not. No, Jillian, you have. They bring back the whole sudden nuclear. That it's not this episode. It's not a remake of this episode, but they're like mm -hmm. being launched into space while a nuclear weapon war is happening, mm. and they have to yeah. decide what to do. Yeah, I dimly remember <laughs> those the whole two seasons. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, the, I I like you know this thing about like yeah, it's true that's fast. Um, I mean, I, I grew up thinking, you know, as a kid in the eighties, I knew I was going to die on any given day. I mean, I knew when I woke up, this could be the last day of my life. Um, and that wasn't realistic, you know, uh, but it could have been, or we were told um, that it was true. Well, we also had a doddering idiot in the white house who thought you could <laughs> okay. pull the bombs back once you launched them and had to yeah. be told that wasn't the case. Um, it was terrifying. Um, but, uh, you know, I really admire this, this episode, like a lot of Twilight Zone episodes on a, on a writerly level that it's just structurally done mm. so well. And this is an art that seems to be so lost these days. I see, you know, movies that are done by good people and it's fine if you break the mold for good reasons and it works, but you know, this is just such a tightly, cor you know, correctly written episode where you establish the character, you show scenes dramatizing it, you have a reason for him going into the vault. Even taking out all of these layers of metaphor and meaning, it makes perfect sense that he would be mm. the one in the vault. You know, and the bomb drops, and, you know, and then you have the twist at the end, the O. Henry thing. Like, I mean, everything is just working, and we can nitpick, like, yeah, you know, I, I, I think... You know, the, those cans of food, you know, yeah, you got a lot. It's still irradiated, you know. Right, you're um, still going to die. <laughs> right. But, you know, but I mean, I still just, I love that even if the bomb, you know, we see these sort of like, uh, we have these little gripes about the wife or how quick the bomb is or, you know, that he's going to die anyway. But it's just such a well-paced and well-structured episode where those twists make perfect sense. Uh, and are ironic and then are tied into a theme are not just like, golly gee, this is what happened next. Uh, surprise, he was the killer all along. Um, so I, I just, I love the structure. It, it, it works. And you're right, though, because it is, on a, on a sort of, as a, from a, a structure perspective, it is really well paced and it's really well laid out. Um, and as well, though, because again, like, if, you, if you're coming into this completely cold, like I know what the, the twist is at the end. It's very well known. But if you came into this completely cold, because it's been set up in that way, and like you say there's nitpicking things about the wife and that sort of thing, though, that final moment, that final twist, because he's obviously you know found the book, attempted suicide or considered suicide, finds the books and that sort of thing, and then to lose his glasses, like it is it is a proper gut punch to leave him in that situation because you are a bit like, oh, wait a minute, what? No, how does this resolve itself? <laughs> Well, and that's just it. It doesn't because he can't even find the gun. Mm. He can't see. And that, that was, 
you talk about well well written stuff, Julian. The way that that shot early on when you see him put on his glasses, we see it from that's his point of view. The one time they do it in the whole episode as he puts on his glasses. So we go from blur. It was excellent camera work, but it's also well scripted because you're like, you don't, there's no talk. You know, I, I get so tired of exposition man having to like, you're, it's a visual <laughs> medium, just show us. And so these early Twilight Zones, Rod Serling was all about like, I have got 24 minutes and I better get everything I can. And so he shows there's silence. I mean, a lot of this is him walking around. It's mm. all on Burgess Meredith's back. I mean, but 17 of the 24 minutes he's on screen by himself and and he's acting serling shows up after one commercial break like about eight hours in a graveyard or something and i almost wonder like we're watching we know we understand how time has passed maybe they thought ah, people don't know because it's black and white that it's dark now but man i agree and so it was and you see that you see not just what a well-written script looks like but then how to shoot it the right yeah. way and we don't we're, the twilight zone never dumbed itself down for the viewers I wish there was more TV that was willing to not dumb itself down. Yes, no, amen to that. Right, well, we are sort of running out of time, so I'm going to run around and see some final thoughts. Uh, so we'll actually start. Julian, final thoughts on on uh, on this episode? I'm good. I mean, it, it's a classic for a reason. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think we, we all love uh, these themes and what it's got to say, and it resonates with us. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, so Tony, any final thoughts? No, I agree. I think it's one of those things where... Um, you're right. It, it, I, I wish it weren't so part of the pop culture so that people could experience it for the first time. I wonder if there's someone out there who, who has Paramount Plus or whatever and is just like, what's this? And sees it for the first time. I would love in 2021 to watch some, you know, 12 year old like I was or eight or however old I was watching it. See it again for the first time. That would be fantastic. So maybe, Scott, when your daughter is old enough, I would love for you to break her heart and then you can report back to <laughs> what it's like through fresh eyes. Oh, Alex, Alex is completely distant from this stuff. So I may try it on the wife and see what she does. I might still get to sit through this episode and see what happens. But I agree totally with what you guys said. It is a classic. It, it, it does sort of like, you know, resonate throughout most of pop culture. So. Um, and also, you know, having Mickey be in it, sort of like you know, um, I know how this was this was saved. Rocky came in and saved him at the end. Um, <laughs> but no, it is a great episode, and I'm really enjoying it. So it, it's standing out against against some of the other. You know, we've had some really good ones as we've gone through, and this one stands out. And it, so it's you know to to be sort of eight in, and you're still going, yeah, this is a classic. Is uh, you know, it's it's starting well as, as a show. So there we have it. That's our that's our eighth episode. Um, so ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for listening thank you very much for con contributing to our Patreon really appreciate it and uh, you know, we'll be carrying on we'll be back next week with another episode so ladies and gentlemen thank you very much and, and uh, Tony we'll it's been an honor having you here where can people check yes. out your oh, yes, oh, good sure. point well done thank, yes thank you Julie. thank you doctor <laughs> I'm on uh, I'm on the Comics in Motion Network the I feel like sister podcast to 20th Century Geek and Stories out of time and pace. We're all the same nerds. So I'm over there. I've got the Indie Comics Spotlight show, and um, we're doing Seasons Greetings, where we are doing a deep dive into seasons of shows. But unlike what you guys are doing episode by episode, we're just doing a full season at a time. So we're in the middle of Buffy right now. Um, so you can just follow me on Twitter at Tricycle Blue Box. And I don't know if you guys know this. This is weird. It's some weird uh, sneaky tail thing. There's this new book out. <laughs> um, I have an essay in it. Have you guys heard of this place? Um, this really amazing critical analysis publisher called Sequar, where people write about comic books. Have you heard about this? I've got it, an essay there. It's it's for those like weird intellectuals who read books, right? Ha! Huh, weird. Yeah. So that has been an honor. So to have you both here, I've not got to thank you both at the same time. So thank you both for letting me be part of that. No, thank you for your contribution because it was ace and it's been an absolute honor doing the book. So, um, you know, we, I don't know if you know, but like, uh, well, I'll talk about that off air in a minute. But yes, sure. but, but thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, we'll talk again soon.